<laughs> oh, I'm so happy to be here with y'all. How many of y'all are involved in the That Man Is You group? Can we see any That Man Is You? Yeah, yeah. I, I told them over, nice, you're sporting the gear, I love it. I told them all last night while we were drinking uh, margaritas that, uh, well, I was alone. It's fine. Um, <laughs> that, that, that I, I'm trying to get them to change the name of the ministry. I know it's a little presumptuous, but I want to change the name to the ministry. And that was their reaction, too, so it's not going to happen. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Whatever. I can take criticism. Okay, uh, let's begin, shall we? Wait, oh, we got any Frannies? Are you a Franny? Nice. Any other Franciscan University, Steubenville folks? Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay, now that I've done uh, pandering, let's open up in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God the Father of mercies, we bless you, praise you, adore you, and sanctify your holy and sacred name. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh the definitive words spoken by the Father to humanity. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your life. We thank you for your words and your deeds among us. Your whole life was salvific, not just your death on the cross and glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, but your whole life, O oh Lord, was salvific because it was lived in perfect union between your divinity and your humanity. So, Jesus, may we imitate with a Eucharistic heart your love for us. May our daily lives reflect the law of the gift that is found in the cross and in the Eucharist. And may it be a truly seamless garment from your offering of yourself to the Father, from the priest's holy offering of yourself at Mass, and our offering in union with you every day of our life. Jesus, may we be bold enough to take up your cro our cross and follow after you, but we can only do that with your Holy Spirit. So, Mother Mary, we ask for your maternal intercession as we pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Threw some of you off with the Holy Ghost part. Some of you are like, Holy Ghost? What? Okay. So, uh, I love talking, I love the Eucharistic Revival. When the bishops announced it, and they're like, oh, we're going to do this Eucharistic Revival, we're going to do a diocesan year, and then we're going to do a parish year, and then it's going to culminate in Indianapolis with the National Eucharistic Revival. I was pumped because it gave me an excuse to hijack everything at my parish for two years in order to talk about the Eucharist. Because one of the things as Catholics, right, we all do this as human beings, the things that are near are the things that we grow overly familiar with and we take for granted. And it becomes, it's, it's kind of ironic that we take for granted the very thing that's called a thank offering, which is what the word Eucharist means, right? Taking something for granted means we cease being, cease being grateful for it. And so the time of Eucharistic revival, I like to call it revival and not renewal. Number one, in the Catholic Church, ever since Vatican II, the word renewal has been done to death. Uh, I like revival because I'm like an old school charismatic uh, in this handsome body. And so I, I love this. And I just imagine the bishops with big tents, right, you know, doing all this stuff, fiery preaching. But the beautiful thing is revival means to have life again, right? To draw our life from that which is Christ Jesus present to us every single day in the most holy sacrament of the altar. The beautiful thing of the Eucharistic revival is meant to remind us periodically and I love this focused intention on the fact that we draw our life from Jesus Christ, from him alone. He alone is our Savior. He alone is our Lord. He alone is our Redeemer. And when we sit before our blessed Lord in prayer or we receive him in Holy Communion, that is the opportunity where our sacrifices, our cross-carrying, gets perfectly united to his once-for-all-time act of love on Calvary 2,000 years ago. The beautiful gift of living a Eucharistic life means we understand the very meaning and purpose of life, which is to be given away. Man can only find himself, Atticantou says, through a sincere gift of himself. That was the, uh, one of the mottos 
of St. Pope John Paul II, this notion of giving oneself away. In fact, that's how we described evangelization. Right? Evangelization is essentially faith only grows in the measure that it's given away. And parents know this when they give their faith away to their kids, and then their kids ask a question, why? And all of a sudden, and you've never asked that question before, and you're like, oh, oh, oh no, I need to figure this out. And now you have an interior desire to go and read and research about your faith. You know, it's a great, this is a cheesy, cheesy joke, but um, a young boy once asked a priest, Father, what's the difference between ignorance and apathy? You know what the priest said to him? He goes, I don't know, and quite frankly, I don't care. And that's the answer, <laughs> ignorance and apathy. The fascinating thing about our Catholic faith is we have a huge ignorance problem. We have a lot of people who don't know what the church teaches about the Eucharist or why the church teaches it. But even more than that, we have an apathy problem. We don't know, but for many of us, we just don't care. So the, the thing is, we devise all of these methods in order to solve the problem of ignorance. But in reality, the much harder but better path is to solve the problem of apathy. Because once someone cares, the, the ignorance problem takes care, of itself, takes care of itself, right? I mean, that makes sense, right? You try to get your kids to read, so what do you do, right? You give them a book that maybe they'd be interested in rather than what the curriculum is interested in, and all of a sudden they finish it in like a week, and you're like, wow, this kid has never read more than five sentences in a row, and now they crushed, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings or whatever. And if that's you, God bless you. Um, but we understand this, right? That apathy is our biggest enemy in the spiritual life. That, I mean, over and over again in the Psalms, right? They, they talk about this. Does the Almighty have knowledge? Right? Does he even know what's going on here? Does he even care? If he doesn't, why should we? And so the movement of the Catholic faith at this time is not just about getting more knowledge. It is about finding meaning and purpose at the center of our lives. And the coolest thing is when we find the very center of our lives, it's not us at the center. This is a thing that we don't tell our young people, and we haven't for generations. So those of you who are not so young, you've been told this too, that you can be anything, that you can do anything. It's this message of positivity and self-esteem, which is good. I mean, I like having self-esteem. My wife thinks I have too much, but it's fine. <laughs> we tell people, I'm a narcissist, but with low self-esteem. So I know at least I'll disappoint myself. Uh, but we talk about this, this understanding, right, of, of, of painting these pictures where they are the center of their universe. And it's not true. And we wonder why, after years of striving, we are unhappy. It's because we're on a quest of self-fulfillment that makes us the center of the story. The hard news that we all have to hear is we are not, though a part of the story, we are not the center of even our own stories. And it's amazing. It's amazing when you realize that. Because then you stop a frantic trying to accumulate, a frantic uh, uh, grasping at things that life, things that often are counterfeits because at least it numbs you to the fact that you're not fulfilled, and you can surrender. And the one who gave you life is the author of life. He put himself at the center of your story. And I love that Nick um, opened up with that St. Augustine quote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Until we are oriented to the kingdom of heaven. Until we seek first the kingdom of heaven, everything else that we run after, that we try to grasp onto, will slip through our fingers like so much sand. But what Christ is calling us into is not just obedience and shut up and get in line. Some of us feel that way. When I talk to people, they feel that way about their faith. That I pray, pay, and obey, and that's it. But Christ says, of his own ministry, he says, I have come to light a fire on this earth, and oh, how I wish it were already blazing. Right? When you look around your life, or your parish, or your diocese, do you see the fire of God, or do you see comfortable people living comfortable lives? I just uh, helped out with a, a men's retreat for that man as you, and I said, you know, it's like we sit there and we say, Holy Spirit, you know, we sing these songs, right, these great songs, right, change my life, I give you permission to move in this small little area. You can do whatever you want, oh Lord, as long as I don't have to give up my six-figure salary and my sweet house and blah, blah, blah. 
Right, we do this. We give conditions to the unconditional love of God. But oh, what a church we would be if, like the 12 apostles, we dropped our nets, we followed him. Every time ministry gets very difficult, I have a little saying that I say to myself because I constantly need to give myself pep talks. <laughs> I say, hand to the plow, brother. Hand to the plow. Right, you know that saying where Jesus says, if any man sets his hand to the plow, he doesn't look back. Right, what happens if you look back when you're plowing your field? You go off course. You ruin your field. Hand to the plow. Hand to the plow. But many of us are afraid to take that step, to let the fire of God change our lives. In John 10, 10, oh, how I wish, oh, wait, what, what does he say? Uh, I come that they might have life and have it overwhelmingly or have it abundantly. Do you feel like you have abundant life? Like your life is set on fire? See, we don't because we want measured doses because we want to be in control. But what if we worship to God who desires for your life something more than even what you are capable of? See, this is the hidden lie at all of the self-help and self-esteem movements. They say that you can be anything you want to be, but the thing that limits you is you. What if you were connected to the God of the universe? What horizons would then be possible? If God is truly your God and God knows you and loves you, then like the Blessed Virgin Mary, you can say, with God all things are possible. You can turn illiterate fishermen to people who conquered the Roman Empire. What could he do with you? What could he do with the wealth and the community and the power that he has just in this room? If every man and woman in this room was just sold out for Christ, Chicago couldn't contain it. It would be too small. But because we're afraid of what's going to happen. See, we, St. Paul has the lesson. He tells us. Live your lives, or have your lives, continually offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. But I don't want to do that because that sounds awful. Have you ever been sacrificed? Not fun, right? Not fun at all, right? It's brutal and it's painful, but here's the deal. We never are alone. This is the message, one of the many messages of the crucifix, that when we gaze at a crucifix, when we see the body tortured and slain on that cross, we don't think... <laughs> okay, let me, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But when we look at the cross, what do we see? We see the biography of our sins. We see the price that God was willing to pay to separate your sins from you. We see the price tag that God puts on your heart to have you made new, to have you made clean, to have you made pure, to make you a new creation. This is what he is willing to do. No greater love has a man than this, he who lays down his life for his friend. Right? And he wants to see you made new. So when we look at the cross, you and I, like, it's, it's horrible. And even Christ three times the night before he died begged for the cup to pass. In John's gospel, in John chapter 12, he says, uh, he, the, a bunch of Greeks come to meet Jesus at the, at the uh, Palm Sunday. And the, the, the chief priest says, see how the whole world goes after him. Then a bunch of Greeks at the feast come up and they say, we want to see Jesus. So Andrew tells Peter, and Peter gets Jesus, and they say, there's some Greeks here who want to see you. And he says, now is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. Behold, my soul is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this hour that I have come into the world. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice from heaven speaks, and he says, I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. This amazing moment where when we look at the cross, we see a helpless, innocent man who was condemned to death by a conspiracy of the powers that be. But when Pope Benedict looked at the cross in Deus Caritas S, one of his, his first great encyclical, I love it, I read it all the time, he said that as we gaze upon the one whom we pierced, we see the omnipotence of God. Men and women have been looking at that cross or reading the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection for centuries now. And it has become the primary motivation to live a life unfettered by our petty hesitations. And they became saints. The only thing separating us from sanctity 
is not two miracles after we die, although it's helpful. I'm working on one miracle. Look, check this out. Whoa! No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> comedian Brian Regan did that at an event, and I was like, that's the funniest thing. Okay, so it's not miracles, right? The thing that we need is a heart that says yes, like the Blessed Virgin Mary. Where did his flesh come from that hung on the cross, that bought us our salvation, that redeemed us? It came from her yes. From the yes of a woman in Nazareth, betrothed to Joseph, she said, fiat, let it be done unto me according to thy word. And that's what Christ is awaiting for you and for me, is a yes without qualification. Yes, but. How many times do we do that? Yes, but. I'll serve you anywhere, Lord, as long as it's in these three ministries for exactly the duration that I want to serve. One priest said to me, and this, this annoys me some. This is why I can't stand priests. <laughs> he said, <laughs> this priest said, yeah, so they just have a way of getting right in your heart. He had this thing, he said, uh, when we serve God, when we, when we offer ourselves for service at the church, but it's only on our time, our ministry, our choice, our whatever, that's not service, that's a hobby. And I was like, well, maybe I want it to be a hobby, right? So what Christ is asking of us is to have a Eucharistic heart, a heart, brothers and sisters, that is unafraid to give itself away, that is strong enough that it can be given, sometimes even to the wrong people. Because sometimes I can tell you that when you learn the law of the gift, you see the gift nature on the cross, you see the gift nature in the yes of the Virgin Mary, and we see the ultimate gift nature, Jesus' fullness, fullest condescension in the blessed sacrament of the altar. Where he gives himself away to be our very nourishment. We see the whole Christian life written there. If we understand it rightly. I want a Eucharistic heart. There's a, a poem called St. Michael the Weyer written by, uh, oh gosh, written by Lowell, I think. And he has this great line where St. Michael, you know, he always has the scales. In one scale I saw him place all the glories of our race. Cups that lit Belshazzar's feast, gems the wonder of the East. Uh, Kublai's scepter, Caesar's sword, many a poet's golden word, many a skill in science vain to make men as gods again. And in the other scale he threw. Things regardless, outcasts few. Martyr ash, arena sand of St. Francis's Court of Strand, and then he has this line that, I read this poem when I was 10, of disillusions and despairs of young saints with grief grayed hairs and broken hearts that break for man. Let me ask you, what breaks your heart? Because there might be something that our Lord is placing upon your heart. See, we're all different. I don't know if you know that. We're so diverse. We're all ish. We're all different. That the Lord, with your history, with your background, even with the wounds you have suffered, for no one goes through this life without, without scars, have formed us and molded us into the person that we are. That Christ Jesus can use our entire history, including our baggage, in order to bring forth and shine forth the kingdom of God. So he places burdens on our hearts, sometimes for a season, sometimes for our whole life, that you are the answer. You are the hands and feet of Christ where he wants to anoint and bless other people. So what burdens your heart? What, at the end of the day, once the moment you hear of something happening, it just rips you up inside? Homelessness, abortion, abandonment, there's so many different things that are wrong with this world that we can, you know, raise our fist and yell and scream, or we can go be of service. We can be taken, blessed, broken, and given, like the Eucharist. You know, on the night where Jesus celebrated the Passover, you knew that something different was happening by the instruction that he gave his apostles. He's like, go into, the, go into town, go into Jerusalem, and there you will meet a man carrying a jug of water. 
And you will go to him and say, where is it? You know, the master have need of a room tonight. And he will take it. And it's like this elaborate thing. I always thought that was so funny. But part of it is because he was in the Essene quarter of Israel, of Jerusalem. The Essenes were uh, men and women, largely men, who were mostly celibate. Not all of them were celibate. They mostly lived in like Qumran, out by the Dead Sea. There's a monastery out there. But some of them had a, there's a part of Jerusalem where they lived. And that's why the man was doing typical labor, don't hate me for saying this, that women did in the city, right? So here he is carrying the water jar for the day's washings and chores and stuff like that. And so this, this significance of where the upper room was and all this, it mattered greatly because these were people who were fasting and praying that the Messiah, the Meshiach would come. And here Jesus says, the master has need of it. And so the apostles go and they find it just as it is and they go. And then right when he starts to pass over, he says, uh, here's, this, here's this line from in, in Uh, Luke 22, verse 15. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he knew something new was happening at this new Passover. That Jesus Christ had a plan for this Passover that was going to be completely different from all the other Passovers that they had ever celebrated. Now, do we know the story of the original Passover? Are you familiar with this? Have you watched The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? I love it. He's such an overactor in that movie. Right, I love that. It's like, what, what does he say to when he sees his wife? He's like, oh my, your eyes are like stars in the Serengeti. Like, it's so, like, over the top. For the longest time with my kids, whenever I would walk into the room and my daughters, and they were little and they loved me, they would say, uh, it's fine, she's 13, my oldest, it's whatever. But, uh, they would walk in my daughters who would hug me and they would go, Daddy, you came home for me. Just melted my heart, right? And uh, it always reminded me of the scene when Moses goes and he just leaves Egypt and he's like about to die and he's in Midian and he goes up to the well and the women are tending their sheep, the daughters of the priest of Midian, and uh, these bad guys come. But the, before the bad guys arrive, they see Moses and they're like, a man, a man, oh, a man right with that like way over the top oh I love it so that my kids every time I walk in the door my daughters will go a man a man right that had nothing to do with the talk I just wanted to tell you something funny about my life so the the Jewish Passover was a feast of slaves they were enslaved in Egypt right we know the story of the plagues and all this stuff but the reality was when God revealed himself to humanity he revealed himself as the redeemer of Israel The word redemption, to redeem, means to buy back, like what we do with coupons. You redeem a coupon, right? It's an economic term that specifically belonged to the slave market. And so you buy back your family out of slavery. They had this term, the goel in Hebrew, kinsman redeemer. This is like the the paterfamilias, the head of your family. If some member, a third cousin, right, went into debt and lost the family home and had to sell himself and his kids into slavery, the Goel had legal standing to go and buy the home and buy the people out of slavery, no matter what other people were going to do or what money was being thrown out there. The kinsman redeemer bought back the family. And so God reveals himself as the Goel of Israel, the kinsman redeemer of Israel. He was on the side of the slaves, not the powerful. Isn't that amazing? The Romans called crucifixion, the original title for it was the punishment of slaves. Jesus Christ identified with that because he's been doing it since the Exodus. So when God reveals himself, he reveals himself as the redeemer of Israel, the one who sets captives free, who pays the ransom. And so the story of the first Passover, he says, take an unblemished male lamb in the prime of its life, one year old, you're to take it and without breaking a bone of its body, you're to sacrifice it. You're to take its blood into a bowl and you're going to spread that, bowl, that blood uh, on your doorpost and lintel with a hyssop branch. And then you're going to cook that lamb whole without breaking any of its bodies, or any of its, I mean its bodies, any of its bones. You're going to cook it whole. And then you're going to eat that, the flesh of the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs to remind you of the bitterness of slavery. Sandals on your feet, ready to rock and roll. I think he actually said ready to rock and roll. That's in the Hebrew. Uh, It gets lost sometimes, but... (laughs) So what happens in the story, right? I mean, the commandment is not just to eat it. They said, if your family is too small for one whole lamb, invite your neighbors over. 
So this is, the, this is the funny thing when we try to understand a Eucharistic heart and a Eucharistic spirituality. Yes, it is a meal, but it's a certain type of meal. It is a sacrificial memorial meal. It is a meal that is first to sacrifice, and once the sacrifice is offered, then can it be communed upon as a meal. This is the beautiful thing about Passover. They were delivered from Pharaoh's tyranny, from slavery, from bondage to Pharaoh. They were delivered from the power of Egypt through liturgy. There was no great war. They prayed, and God came down and delivered their people. When they would start the conquest of the Holy Land as they crossed the Jordan River and they entered upon the outskirts of Jericho, for seven days they took the Ark of the Covenant round about the city and they prayed. On the seventh day they went seven times with the Levites, the priests, not the, not the warriors, not the guys with the biggest battle axes or the people with the siege machines, but the prayer led the way. And then at last they shouted out, they blared the trumpets, and the walls came a-tumbling down. They conquered through liturgy. At one point, so I do a lot of prison ministry. Before COVID, I used to go pretty much every other week, but COVID kind of ruined a lot of that stuff. So many things. And uh, so I was doing, I, I do prison ministry, and I always get at these retreats, the, these anti-Catholic comments, which are a lot of fun. And uh, so one of them was, you know, why do you, you Catholics are so legalistic. You're so legalistic. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. All you have to do is have faith on Jesus. His righteousness is applied to you and that's it. But you add to the saving work of Jesus with your Pope and your sacraments and your this and your that. So I said to the guys, I laid out this vision of the sacramental worldview of the Bible. And one guy said, no, you're so legalistic. Like, oh, you got to have the right kind of bread and this and that. And I said, let me tell you the story of Moses and the Amalekites. They're fighting the Amalekites. And Moses has his hands raised over the people. And then Moses' arms get tired. And so what happens? You guys know the story? His hands start drooping, and they start losing. And then so his buddy Aaron, or Joshua and her, come up, and they roll a rock so Moses can sit down, and they stand on either side of him so they can prop his arms up. And then Scripture says they mowed the Amalekites down, which is, you know, it's kind of intense. Um, but the idea of that story, I said, how legalistic that the degree of arm, oh, is that a 45? Is that at a 47 degree? People died over whether or not these things. Why do these things matter? Because the moment we corrupt the outward sign, we destroy the meaning of the work. God reveals his power in and through nature. Why did Moses have to strike the Nile with the staff? Couldn't God just have turned it into blood? Why did Moses have to stretch forth his hand with his staff over the Red Sea? Couldn't God just have parted it? Yes, 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 he could have. But God always chooses to work through creation to manifest his divine power. So what are the sacraments? The sacraments are the seven ways that God manifests his divine presence and glory to us through using the matter and form of creation. Now, you know that phrase, hocus pocus? That actually comes from an Anglican derogatory term about Catholics in the 15 and 1600s, because if you remember the Latin Mass, when they would celebrate the Eucharist, right, the priests, uh, they would all be facing east, and then the priest, whenever you knew, right, they'd ring the bells, then the priest would say only two words of the consecration out loud, hoc est, this is my body, and then he'd lower his voice to the rest of it. So hoc est, and they used to make fun of that, saying hocus pocus dominocus, right, that was the, that was the phrase, that, oh, it's all magic, what is magic? Magic is the use of matter and words in order to manipulate the gods or spirits or the elements or whatever to do your will. That is not the sacraments. In fact, the sacraments, that sounds more like technology. In fact, the sacraments are the exact opposite. God the Father lays out for us through Jesus Christ the words and the matter and form of what we say and what we pray. And then God keeps his promises. When a validly ordained priest takes the right bread into his hands, and he speaks the words of consecration. This isn't magic. This is the power of creation. Happening right here for us. So that you and I can become participants in the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. St. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I cannot, I, I talked about 1 Corinthians 10 last night, 10 and 11. I cannot say this. Listen, listen to how St. Paul 
Let's, I get so excited. Can you tell about this stuff? I want you to know, brethren, that our fathers, so he's talking about ancient Israel, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What is the cloud? The cloud was, they had a column of fire by, by night and a cloud by day. The cloud is the Shekinah, the glory cloud of God. It represented God's holy presence. Typically, we understand that as the Holy Spirit, right? So they had the cloud and the sea. And this is, this is what he says in verse 2. 1 Corinthians 10, 2. Listen to this language. This blows my mind. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. So St. Paul is talking about when ancient Israel was delivered from Egypt and they went under the cloud, and the cloud was representative of the Holy Spirit, and they went through the waters of the Red Sea, they were baptized into Moses. And then he says this, and all ate the same supernatural food. And all drank the same supernatural drink. This is what he's saying about ancient Israel. Why am I yelling? Okay. <laughs> For they drank from the supernatural rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So there was supernatural drink from the rock. Remember, they struck the rock, water came. Well, there was a story that you find in the Mishnah and the Talmud that that rock followed them. Right? It followed them throughout their, their wanderings into, uh, uh, towards the Holy Land. So the rock that they are drinking, the water that they are drinking, is Christ. So if this is what we had in Moses, how much greater is it going to be now that Christ has become incarnate? And if this only makes sense, if we believe that the Eucharist is Christ, because if it's just a symbol, if it's just a sign, if it's a, it's a pleasant fiction for us, then the actual Old Testament way supersedes the new. I mean, the last time I went to Mass, I didn't have a rock that was rolling after me. I didn't have bread that rained down from heaven. I didn't eat some lamb flesh and all my neighbor's firstborn children. I, okay, no, that was weird. That was weird. Now these things are warnings for us not to do evil as they did. Some were idolaters. Do not, do, uh, do not be idolaters as some of them were. Do not indulge in immorality as some of them did. Do not put the Lord to the test as some of them did. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as a warning, but they were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. And then he goes down to verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, shun the worship of idols. I speak as to sensible men. Judge for yourselves what I say. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. And here's the kicker. I said this verse last night. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices partners in the altar? Here's a part of the thing that we might miss in the Israelite practice. Let's say you had committed a horrible sin and you wanted to go up to the temple in order to atone for your sin. So you grabbed your favorite bull calf and you processed them all the way to Jerusalem. You went up the hill of Jerusalem. You waited outside the temple. And then when it was your turn, you came forward. And before you entered into the holy place of the temple where the altars were, the priest handed you a knife. And you butchered the animal. First you killed it, and the priest got, caught the blood in a bowl, and then went and threw it against the altar, and then went in front of the Holy of Holies and splashed it in front of the Holy of Holies. Because to ancient Israel, blood was like a detergent. Sin was pollution. And so you had to get rid of the pollution by the blood of animals. And that's why in the book of Hebrews it says, the blood of bulls and the blood of goats do not take away sin. And this is why Jesus, the, before his incarnation, said, consequently, I have said, uh, consequently, a body thou hast prepared for me, lo, I come to do your will. It's like the, the author of Hebrews is trying to paint this picture of why the word became flesh. Because the sacrificial system, though good, was never enough. Though it pointed as signs and symbols to the ultimate fulfillment, the word had to come into the flesh. And he had to offer himself. Behold, I come to do your will. Because the blood of bulls and the blood of goats do not actually make one righteous. So he gives us the blood of Christ. And in the Eucharist, St. Paul is saying, 
Isn't the cup a blessing which we bless? Isn't it a participation in the very blood of Jesus? And the, the bread which we break, isn't that a participation in the very body of Jesus? And then he takes it one step further. And this is where he takes the Eucharist and applies it to the church. Aren't we who partake of the one loaf, many, though many, one body in Christ? So we have now the church imagery of the body of Christ. Many parts, one head, one body. And he's drawing all of our attention to the Eucharist. When you eat the flesh of Jesus Christ and you drink his blood, when you take the cup of salvation, you are participating in what he did 2,000 years ago. You're not re-sacrificing him. Just like people who were ancient Israelites did not believe that they were uh, distinct from their Old Testament, Book of Exodus ancestors. They believed that when they celebrated Passover 1,000 years later, that they were bringing that past event to this present event. They were making the past present. Now, the coolest thing is we have the creator God of the universe write himself into the story. So instead of one past event, he makes that one past event present on every altar throughout the world. So his once-for-all sacrifice becomes the very food that sustains us in our Christian journey. Consider the people of Israel. Are they not those who eat the sacrifice as partners in the altar? Partners in the altar. We don't have a table, we have an altar. An altar is a place you sacrifice stuff on. So brothers and sisters, what does it mean to have a Eucharistic heart in the light of this beautiful Eucharistic revival? Number one, it means, yes, we acknowledge that it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And if you struggle with that, it's okay to struggle with that. It's not like it's obvious. <laughs> As St. Thomas Aquinas said, we can't trust our feeble senses. They fail. But we can trust our hearing and our faith. Jesus said, this is my body. So if we believe that Jesus is God, then okay, we can bend the knee and say, my Lord and my God. We can say, behold, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. We can scream out like the apostles did at the resurrection, it is the Lord. So we start there. Number one, the Eucharist is really Christ Jesus. So then that moves to something else. Then the Mass is not just table fellowship. The table fellowship is secondary or tertiary. And I love the word tertiary. I don't get to use it that often, so I'm happy that I get to use it. The primary thing, though, is the offering of Christ to the Father. So what is Mass? Religious entertainment. No. See, this is the part that's the hardest for us modern people, because everything is entertainment today. You don't get educated, you get edutainment, which is the worst thing ever when you combine those two things. But that's what we get, right? Everything is entertaining. Everything is meant to be fun. Everything is meant to be enjoyable. And then you come and you sit in one spot and you stare forward. And, you're, and if you're a kid, right, that's like the worst thing on the face of the earth. You get all twitchy, all fidgety. My, my kids, I have uh, two kids diagnosed with ADHD. Don't know where they got that from. Actually, when... <laughs> When the doctor asks, when the doctor asks, he goes, oh, it's a, yes, it appears they have ADHD. Uh, they say 50% of the time it's one of the parents, so which one of you has it? And my wife goes, oh, my husband. <laughs> and I was like, what? <gasps> my whole childhood, right? Like I reinterpreted the whole past. Isn't it funny how one piece of information can change everything? Well, that's what I hope this information about the Holy Mass is. Because the most important thing that happens at the Mass is the holy sacrifice of Christ is offered to the Father. That's the most important thing. It's even more important than you receiving Holy Communion. You're not entitled to it. That's why St. Paul in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says, whoever therefore eats the cup, eats the bread, or <laughs> eats the cup. If you eat the cup, you in the wrong church. Okay. Oh, it's like, it's like a Panera bread bowl. Okay. Uh, that was weird and kind of offensive. Okay. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, examine himself and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So we say to ourselves, I'm not entitled to this. He's giving himself away. So I need to make myself ready. I need to go and steep myself in Scripture. I need to hear the gospel anew to my heart to prepare my heart to say, yes, Lord, my God, I believe. I believe that you are the risen Lord, not the dead flesh of a crucified one, but the risen, ascended flesh and blood of the God of the universe who took on our humanity 
so that we might be united to his divinity forever. So it starts with realizing that when I come into Mass, I am coming to participate in the once for all, once for all time, once for all people, the once for all sacrifice of Christ, the self-offering to the Father. Jesus was the only priest in the history of the world that was also the victim. He was the one who offered and the one that was offered. Right? When priests are sacrificing lamb after lamb on the feast of the Passover, they are the ones doing the sacrificing. They are not the ones sacrificed. When John the Baptist sees Jesus near the time of Passover, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why right before we receive Holy Communion, the Lamb motif is said about a thousand times. Behold the Lamb of God. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. When we come forward, we can say like St. Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Right, or seven and eight, where he says, For Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed, therefore let us keep the feast. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. He is the new lamb that has been offered to redeem the new Israel. So we cover our doorposts and lintel with his blood through baptism. That is a washing of our souls in the blood of the lamb. And then we go forward to eat the flesh of the lamb in the appearance of unleavened bread. Isn't it amazing how what happened in Exodus, celebrated in Passover, is now sacramentalized in the new covenant? Because what happened, as St. Paul says, these were written down for your instruction. God uses the events of the past to tell us more about what he's doing for us in Christ Jesus. So when I come to Mass, I'm not coming to be religiously entertained. You have to get that out of your mindset, or else you'll make it all about you and not about him. See, because this is the problem. We keep wanting to assert ourselves, insert ourselves into the center of the story. And when we put ourselves in the center of the story, you know what we come with? Our preferences. Well, I like this music, so therefore I don't go to that liturgy. I like that music. And it's like, we need to destroy our pre That's perfect for at home. That's perfect for friend, you know, devotional life. The church makes a distinction between religious and liturgical or sacred music. And so when we come forward for the liturgy, we need to say, how can I give my utmost for his highest? How can I make it not about me, but about giving him all the glory, all the praise, all the honor? Because here's the amazing thing. Once we acknowledge the transcendent nature of God's divine majesty, only then his condescension into my heart, only then him coming down and becoming food for us, do we actually behold the mystery in its glory. But if we start with, yes, I deserve this, this is Jesus, he's my, you know, I look at my heart and I find Christ and blah, 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 and it's about me. What we end up doing is if we start with God being near us and we don't start with his transcendence, we can never get to the majesty. But if we start with the majesty, then his imminence, his closeness to us becomes all that more glorious. I know some of y'all might have been raised in the early day, or in the, in, the, in, the, in the early days of the church. Some of y'all 2,000 years old, shocking. No, but a lot of older Catholics will tell me, you don't know what it's like. I never heard that God loves me. I never, all I heard was the justice of God and the fear of hell and duty, duty, duty. And I kind of giggle because he said duty. But then the idea of it, that's immature. But the idea of this, the idea of this is if you start with the justice of God, if you start with the transcendence of God, sometimes people don't ever emphasize the closeness of God, the proximity, the nearness, the Emmanuel, God with us. But the problem is, if you start with the closeness, you can never get back to the transcendence. And so what Christ is calling us into in this age of Eucharistic revival is to realize what gives us life. And it's not a what, it's a who. Jesus Christ is the source of our life because he alone is divinity and humanity perfectly united. And what does he do with that divinity and humanity? He gives it away. First there, and then on the altar. First on the cross, and then on the altar. He gives it away. All he asks of you is to bring your full self forward, repenting of the sins you committed, and with a word, a sacrifice, a hymn of praise on your lips. What do you get a God who has everything? All you can tell God is thank you for what you've done. And the amazing thing about our Catholic Christian faith is he gives us that too. Thank you is what the word Eucharist means. He even gives us a perfect way 
to say thank you back to God. So when we come here, we come for the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where the priest, who is also king, offers the once-for-all sacrifice of himself to the Father. Not because the Father was angry and getting out his justice on some victim, but because the Son and the Father desired to pay our debts, to destroy the works of sin and the devil, to set us free. The transfiguration, you remember who Jesus was talking to? Who was he talking to? Who were the two dead guys? Moses and Elijah. And you remember what they were talking about? His departure. In Greek, his exodus. Talking to Moses about his exodus. Because he is the Passover lamb. Brothers and sisters, you and I are all under the cloud, and we pass through the waters. We have drank from the same supernatural rock and eaten the supernatural food that is the Eucharist. So then we go forth with the Eucharistic heart, ready and willing to lay down our lives so that others might find the bread of life. Amen? Amen. Pray for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to read Psalm 50. I love Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes, he does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire, round about him a mighty tempest. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Right, so you hear the transcendence of God. Gather to me my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am your God. I am God, your God. I do not reprove you for your sacrifices. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. This is a phrase my dad would say to me. For I will accept no bull from your house. That was offensive. Nor he go from your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. That's how you know God's a Texan. I know all the birds of the air, and all that moves in the fields is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and all that is in it is mine. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God, this is God saying this to his people, offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you are a friend of his, and you keep company company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. This is why we do the penitential act before the liturgy of the Eucharist. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear and there be none to deliver. He who brings thanksgiving as his sacrifice honors me. To him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. Lord Jesus, may we come before you, before this altar, every time we enter this holy and sacred place. May through the consecrated hands of our priests, we offer you a sacrifice of thanksgiving, the Eucharist. May we be unafraid, Lord Jesus, to fall on our knees, beating our breasts, acknowledging our sins, so that we might be set free by your unending love, whose mercies are new every day. Being freed from the grip of sin and darkness, may you make us worthy by your divine grace to receive you, the sacred gift of the blessed sacrament. That's so filled with your divine presence, we may walk out into the world that is unbelieving and be Christ to them as you were to us. Taken, blessed, broken, and given. That those who sit in darkness might see a great light. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And in your name we pray. Amen.
Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all.